Welcome back, everybody, to the Hearthstone Championship Tour Winter Preliminaries. My name is Frodan. I'm joined by Brian Kibler to talk a little bit about what's happening outside the stream. Upcoming next, we have Oskaka, the world champion, taking on a, a player that we don't really know too much named Mork a lot. Another David versus Goliath story. Very cool to see. But before we do that, let's check in with Kibler and see what have you been watching off stream. Can you talk about some of the names and the players going through the brackets? Well, well we did see uh, Tice just lose on the stream. Uh, a number of fan favorites uh, were able to win their first round off stream. Uh, Oskaka, who we will be seeing next, uh, he won his first round, uh, along with Kalento uh, and Gara are both uh, players who, who also have advanced so far, Inclu as well as uh, Nyria, who was one of the BlizzCon participants last year. And taking a look at how everything has developed so far, is it really big surprise that Tice lost this early on? Or in your opinion, is this something to be expected from your years of competing in events like this? I mean, it's it's difficult to really say that, that any player has a huge advantage over any other player. And, and it's... it's uh, in a, a format like this, you're going to find a lot of players who may have flown under the radar previously, who've just now had a chance to uh, to sort of come up and get noticed thanks to the Hearthstone Championship Tour. And, you know, to finally wrap this up, is there any sleepers, you know, based off what you said, is there any, like, unknown players or any person that you're looking for, or do you feel like this is the tournament of a lot of the dogs that we're used to seeing, like Oskok and all them? I'm not really familiar enough with the European scene to know a lot of the players who might be flying under the radar there, but there are a number of players uh, in the in the Americas uh, our preliminaries coming up next week. Uh, I know, uh, I forget the, the numbers at the end of his name, but Ray C is, is a player who I've actually known for a long time through other games uh, who, who has put up a lot of results recently uh, in Hearthstone as well. All right, well, it's going to be exciting to see for the next week what's happening at NA. But this week is all about EU. My personal person that I think that you have to watch out for is Crane. And I'm pretty sure that you guys will hear about it from the casters who are also friends with him as well. Speaking of which, let's hand off to the desk and see what's coming up for our next series with Oskaka versus Morgulot. Take it away, boys. Thank you very much, Dan. Crane is definitely a guy to watch out for. Former teammate of mine as well, and someone who was making a bit of noise last year. Joining me on the desk this time is going to be Sotl and D2. Uh, all of us are the amateur casters, as we've been <laughs> called by Rob. But, you know, we're going to be making some noise right now, I think. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, obviously, we all came from the Blizzard, so you think you can cast Talent Search. Um, Aqua, I have worked with you a ton in the past. We've pretty much come up through the Hearthstone ranks together. D2, my first time working with you, but I'm sure it's going to be a pleasure. Yeah, it's really awesome to be able to cast with you guys. Obviously, we've had a lot of conversations throughout this week, you know, uh, our travels basically going through workshops, all right. that kind of stuff. So it's going to really be really awesome. I just casted Tice. Now we're going to cast Oskaka. I'm going from the Europe champion to the world champion. I mean, how much better could this be, honestly? And the Europe champion did lose his match, which is uh, something we didn't predict, you know. And the world champion's now up. And as was Kaka, if you were maybe watching some of these games, do you think like, oh no, the Europe, the Europe champion just lost. Could this uh, other potential player that no one knows about take a game off me? So, you know. Shaky, shaky for the uh, the current known players, at least. Sure, it definitely sets a precedent of, of anything can happen. And I think the important note here is that what that is saying is that all these players are here on merit. They're all extremely powerful Hearthstone players. They've got here, whether it's through ladder points, whether it's through winning tournaments, um, online tournaments, or whether it's through qualifying as a Tavern Hero, they're all extremely accomplished. And just because you haven't heard of a player does not mean that they're a weaker, uh, weaker specimen in the tournament. You know, our... our shining example of that is Crane, who is in a very similar position to where Oskaka was last year. The whole pro scene respects him as one of the top players in the world, but he just hasn't had that huge breakout performance yet. So, Subtle, anything can happen or any Finn can happen? Because you might see it here. There's a there's a Paladin in Oskaka's lineup. <laughs> but I think uh, Oskaka is very, just to answer your question, I mean, Oskaka is a really confident person. You can tell he's always getting high on the ladder, so I expect he's not going to really think too much into that upset just now, and he's probably going to play his game, and I expect him to get out of this. As we see the bands right now, Shaman Ban and Paladin Ban. Shaman Ban again. These pro players are not like in uh, <laughs> going against a face shaman and i i don't blame him that deck is so explosive so much reach like back in the day when face hunter was a, re a real threat uh, sh face shamans are a completely different animal you know being able to do like 20 damage from hand in one turn it's got some crazy reach and one thing i've noticed from oskaka uh six so anti is no druid what do you think of that's all very very interesting that may be um a read from them that 
um, sort of the next level meta game call that they expect everyone to expect Druid, and therefore their lineups will be strong against Druid. So they've chosen not to bring the Druid in that sort of sense. Um, I imagine they all feel it's a powerful deck, and it's just something that they've chosen not to bring on expectation. Um, but yeah, Face Shaman ban is, is very, very interesting. And it's interesting that you made the uh, the Hunter comparison, Aqua, because we actually see a Hunter in that lineup as well. And Oskak has looked at it and said, you know, which of these two aggressive <laughs> decks am I more scared of? I'm going to get rid of the one with the Doomhammer in it. Yeah, typically the Shaman's been a better aggressive deck as of late. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we just to answer your question from before, Oskaka and Tice bring very kind of anti-aggressive lineups, and that really worked out for them in the World Championship. So it's maybe what they're kind of thinking of going into the situation. And I mean, the Shaman, the one thing I like about this, how they're going about this, is they're they're getting rid of the polarizing decks in that Shaman, right? The Shaman's very one-dimensional, very aggressive, and it really can form the way you could, you bring the rest of your decks if you're able to just get rid of one kind of aspect. I guess if you're going for a giant bracket as well, one way you can win a lot of games is having these super aggressive decks that kind of have those situations where they can just win anything if you get the right hand. So giving yourself those opportunities more often with multiple aggressive decks can really kind of blow out the game for you, get you fast wins, put opponents on tilt as well. If you win too fast aggro games in your first game, like they might be like, oh man, like I can't deal with this. So with the players of experience as well, um, Playing against aggressive decks can really like have like psychological impacts on you, right. especially if they are blowout games. Yeah, there's a real crash of adrenaline because when you're about to play a big game like this, particularly on stream, you know, there's a build of emotion and a build of tension that comes up until that moment where you start the first game. And if then those that first game and then maybe even the second game afterwards is just a blowout on turn six and you've lost the game, the crash, you know, the drain of emotion out of you as that happens can easily just lead to the third game going the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. The, your mindset in these situations can really pay, play a, an important role. I want to talk about Morgulad's overall lineup. I mean, look at sure. it. It's so aggressive going with the Hunter and the Shaman, mm -hmm. as well as Druid. Do you think there's going to be an aggro Druid and the war? I'm expecting Patron. What do you guys think? I would definitely lean towards Patron here. Aggro Druid has uh, disappeared a little bit recently. We haven't seen as much of it as it was for that that one season where Cursed first pioneered it, being the first player to mm. Legend, and Sixo playing it on stream to great success as well. Uh, since then, it's fallen off a little bit, I think primarily just because of how powerful mid-range Druid has yeah. proven to be. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was just standard mid-range Druid, but I would definitely lean towards Patron. I'm with you on that one. Mm -hmm. I mean, mid-range Druid offers consistency in matchups. It doesn't have any real bad matchups. It has okay matchups, and it has good matchups. So if you can bring a deck that has that, it just increases your win rate, right? But aggro Druid would create a lot of surprise. So, <laughs> and I want to see that warrior to be like life coach's old mech warrior, you know, <laughs> super aggressive. That's what I want to see from his lineup. So us Kaka, we've seen uh, some of the pros decks already, and this lineup is looking very similar to some of the pros we've already seen. Yeah. So our expectations on the warrior are probably going to be patron, secret paladin that's been banned, so it's not an issue, oil rogue as well. But warlock, which we've discussed throughout this broadcast already, is a big question mark. It is indeed, yeah. We've we've talked very much about the range of decks we can get from it. Um, I've I saw a lot of Zoo in my game. Uh, I wasn't sure. Did we see any Reno in the in the Tice set? We did not. Okay. So so far we've just seen the quicker Warlock decks, but as we've we've spoken to death, there is a, a large variation of ways to play Warlock, um, even just in individual archetypes. If you say you're playing Reno Lock, it's it doesn't identify what your deck is. You know, you can choose to play the Leroy combo, which makes you very very favored against other Reno Locks who are playing the slower version. Um, so there's all sorts of considerations to go in, and the difficulty in queuing up against a Warlock deck on the first game, how do you mulligan? Well, I mean, that's kind of the strength of what Morgulot has brought here, right? Mm. I mean, a lot of his classes are kind that's of like, let's, true, just yeah. be, let's just mulligan <laughs> for the fastest start yeah. possible and you know, try to go from there and try to kill my opponent as, as quickly as possible. Obviously, Patron is kind of a bit different if he is bringing that deck, but you know, I'm kind of liking this the, the setups for both players. Like, nice theme for both players, for Oskaka, a little bit of the anti-aggro, and for Morgulot going for that all-out aggro style. And I mean, one thing to think about as far as going for all-out aggro style, I mean, you can't ban everything, right? right. Something's going to get yeah. through. Yeah. Uh, it's just interesting, just about Morgulad, he is a Bulgarian player as we understand it, and I believe all of his points have come from ladder finishes mm. to get here. He hasn't uh, had any tournament victories, so he may be an, an inexperienced tournament player. Um, these might be the decks that he's just successful with on ladder, what he's brought his points with. So this might be a different dynamic 
for him here. Uh, D2, can you talk a little bit about the differences perhaps between ladder play and tournament play? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people from home, sometimes you see players on, you know, playing for the first time on screen. They see some of these misplays and, you know, oh, this guy's so bad at Hearthstone. But really, it gets to you when you're playing sometimes in your first LAN and you get really nervous up there. So I, I can definitely, you know, attest to that, having, you know, traveled a long way for the uh, NA Championships way back in the day. So, I mean, when you get up there for the first time, when even when you're playing just, you know, a, a big tournament in front of a lot of people on Twitch, it can be really Really nerve-wracking. So definitely, it's going to be an interesting to see how this goes. I'm not expecting any nerves from Oskaka. On the other hand, Morglod might experience them. It's a comfort level, right? You're sat in your own home. You know, you're comfy. You got your music playing. You're watching Twitch. You're bashing out some Hearthstone, and then all of a sudden, you're sat in a in a location. People are watching you. You're on the spot. You've got to play perfectly because you know tens of thousands of people are watching you. So if you don't have that experience, it's very easy to get into a situation where you make a misplay and then you're just like, oh no, I've messed up. Everyone's watching me, everyone's looking at me. And it takes a lot of tournament experience over time. It's something you have to work on through just playing in tournaments that will uh, get you that confidence where that tilt doesn't happen. But we're actually going into game number one here. Warrior, ooh, at, ooh a warrior ooh. mirror. Control warrior versus patron. Now, Sol, you are a patron. Uh, Supporter, sympathizer, <laughs> I'm gonna say, because of your Patron opinion. Patron sympathizer, wow, okay. Yeah, I'm printing that on my business cards. <laughs> so what do you think of this matchup? Uh, I think the Warrior has a very good matchup against us. I've seen Stan Sifka. <laughs> which, which Warrior? Oh, the controller, sorry. <laughs> the controller. War I've seen Stan Sifka do some amazing things with Control Warrior against Patron, uh, even before the nerf. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this? Now uh, we have a different style of Patron. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you. I think if you could say the, the switch to the more mid-range style since the Warsong nerf, if it's if it's helped any matchup, it might kind of be this one, because you can you know beat them up in the mid game with things like Shredder, which is a, a really strong card against Warrior. But these days, most Control Warriors tend to be running stuff like Double Brawl. They play Revenge as well, which we see in Morgulard's Mulligan there that he sends away. And there you go. The Brawl being in the opening hand gives him so much security if this is Patron, uh, especially if you then have a second one in your deck for the second wave, that there is a very, very real tendency for the, the Patron Warrior to just run out of damage in this matchup. What do you think about the, that Mulligan standoff we just had here? And both players waiting oh so gosh. long to go through that Mulligan, maybe wanting to watch what their, how many cards their opponent was going in Mulligan before they oh went with that. Gosh. And we have the Greetings going back and forth. I wonder if Oskaka is predicting Patient Warrior just like we did when we saw that lineup right. of Morgallad. So that kind of maybe something goes in his head. Obviously, if you're playing Patron in the in the Warrior Mirror, whether it's Control Warrior mm -hmm. or if it's oh, Patient Warrior, you want that Patron. If you're in the Patron Mirror, you get your Patrons out first. It's basically game over. Yes. Against the Control Warrior, you ha basically have to spawn your Patrons and cross your fingers that they don't have That's the That's exactly it. Do it as early as possible. Yeah. Hope they didn't get the Brawl. If you get Patrons to stick, then you're in good shape. If they do have the Brawl, you're probably losing. Um, but yeah, really interesting point, I think, D2, about the Mulligans, because a Warrior is one of the most interesting classes to look at how many cards they keep, because you get so many information, so much information on likelihood of Fiery War Axe. And especially in a, a Warrior Mirror, suddenly things like Acolyte of Pain look a little tempting because of how they would interact with, say, an Armorsmith. If you watch the Mulligan and suspect they have a weapon, then Acolyte of Pain probably isn't a good keep for you. Um, so that standoff that you saw probably was just both what players no. wanting to dig for that little bit of information. One thing to consider as well, especially in a Warrior Mirror, uh, not essentially the same decks, is information is important because sometimes you may not get the information you need to know it's Control or Patron until like turn five or six. So you, you can kind of fly blind for quite a while because like Unstable Ghoul is a clear indicator that it's going to be Patron. But if Unstable Ghoul isn't playing, you just say play Armorsmith by Acolyte, Death Spite. You know, you're not given enough information to your opponent to what you're playing. And then suddenly they play, say, Shield Maid, and you think, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> like, this could be a problem. So, right. you know, it's a it's very hard to get a read at this point uh, on uh, Morgallad. It is, and I think Oskaka sat and considered that turn for a very long time and ended up just playing out the, the Unstable Ghoul, which was you know the vanilla on-curve play, if you like. Um, but definitely, if he's suspecting Patron Warrior from his opponent, um, you, Unstable Ghoul is a card you can only play early or when you are immediately generating Patrons with it. Because if you just play Unstable Ghoul onto a board to your opponent and they just go, oh, thanks, I'll just, I'll just drop this 5-mana 3-3 three, three that spawns itself now. So 
Um, he's probably considering whether or not Morgulard is playing patron here when he decides to essentially just throw away that unstable ghoul. Yeah, and basically, I mean, uh, like you said, he's thinking through all these different options, and Oskaka isn't trying to play any mind games with Morgulard here. He has so many different lines of play and yeah. so many kind of implications for everything he went for there. If he tossed away his coin playing the Acolyte, it maybe makes it much more difficult to get the patrons out in time. So you can definitely see that Oskaka is considering every single option and basically just live coaching it up here, wanting to make sure that he gets the best play every single time. Hey, you've got the time, you know, use that rope. Life coach definitely does, and it does uh, play to his advantage. As well, like, like the one thing that the rope can do as well, against impatient players, it can kind of wind them up a little bit. Right. And they might make a mistake. So, you know, there's, that can be a mind game in itself. It's also important to note, guys, if you haven't been checking out the bracket, this is a round of 64. So these guys have played, like, a game or two already, or had a buy, so... You know, these guys are already on the progress of going through winners. So that's uh, quite important to know. Yeah, that makes it that makes this match so much more important, right? I mean, it seems like such a daunting amount of people. You start with the round of 256, essentially, because we had, you know, the 128 plus those Tavern Heroes. And now they're two matches away from getting to that round of 16. And for those of you who don't know, the round of 16 is when you get the money, right? Obviously, you want to get to that eight so that you can go yeah. to the Europe Championships. But you get the money when you go round of 16, and that's where we're stopping today. So they're really close to kind of advancing that stuff to that spot. And just for a moment, I want to talk about the uh, Acolyte play that Oskaka made on the previous turn. He did essentially just toss an Acolyte of Pain out into a Fiery War Axe, but looking at his hand right now, he knows, you know, regardless, he doesn't know yet. This could be Control Warrior, it could be Patron Warrior, but regardless, your goal is if you can generate patrons on turn five. Um, so he's going to play that Acolyte of Pain. He gets it War Axe, but it does just get him one card deeper into his deck for Inner Rage. And if he gets Inner Rage, he achieves that goal of generating patrons on turn five using the coin. Yeah, absolutely. And the the nice thing here about Morgala, I do like him holding back that Fire War Axe. It does kind of, you know, maybe bait out something that he could kill out with it in the following turn. Doesn't really need to play it out every single turn. The Control Warrior is just trying to control the board and control everything that's coming out of the Patron Warrior. So I like that holdback by Morgala. And Oskaka just kind of in a bind here. And nothing out of Morgala yet to show what kind of warrior he is right now. And that's the big issue for Oskaka. That's probably why he's taken so long. He's thinking, what on earth am I playing against? I have no idea at this point. And still, uh, Morgala can keep that concealed if he doesn't say... Well, the Brawl is the big indicator. Ysara, of course, is another one, but and Revenge, but you're not going to just play that. The other cards in his hand could be featured in Patron as well, and most likely are. It's also uh, an interesting fact that Morgalad is has a PhD in psychology, oh, okay. so he's got like a mind game barrier. You ain't mind gaming me. Yeah. Wow. I know all about this stuff. Oskaka, you go ahead and rope me every turn. Like, I'm <laughs> mentally stable. We're going to do this. But it's interesting. Um, You know, you said earlier on you, you think that Oskaka was just considering all of his options. And the fact that he's doing it every single turn here, you know, I don't think he's doing it to tilt his opponent in any way or like that, anything like that, but it might be a, a deliberate effort just to say, this is how I'm going to play this tournament. I'm just going to take 90 seconds every turn, life coach style, just to think about not just this turn, but next turn, the turn after, the implications of everything I can possibly do. Yeah, and this is, again, the round of 64. This is extremely important for him. He wants to make sure he gives himself the best chance. I mean, one misplay here could mean the difference between winning this championship and going home, because we know he's such a great player. He's the world champion here. And uh, just over, I mean, Right now, it's just a really tough spot for him. He has so many cards, but I mean, Morgulot has all of the answers here. I yeah, mean, this game is progressing at a slightly slow pace to start off here, but we're essentially waiting for Oskaka to, to either gain enough mana or pick up the extra activators that he needs to then make the decision about whether or not he wants to go off with his patron generation turn. And once we see that happen, we're going to start seeing the game start progressing a lot quicker. Then we might see the brawl and Oscar going, oh, okay, I know what's going on now. I know what's up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be probably the big moment, really, at, like you said, once he launches these patrons. And there's uh, Morgulad play, something like a shield mate, or something like that, which he doesn't have at the moment. So another thing as well for Oskaka, this is his first official kind of Hearthstone tournament since becoming world champion. Sure. So he's going to be, he's a hungry guy. He's going to want to win this and win the championship and get a slot in BlizzCon ready to show that, no, I'm the world champion. This is this is a cakewalk for me. I should just be walking into that uh, world champion spot. So yeah, that's a lot. There's a lot of stuff like Oskaka probably has gone in his head other than just the match. 
actually. By the way, I want to talk about the last play where Oskaga equipped the Fire War X. Basically, he was preparing for a patron turn from his yes. opponent. He was thinking that he it might go off there. I need this Fire War X along with his Execute in order to clear out some of these patrons, and maybe I can do some some other things. He didn't play the Dread Corsair because it obviously just dies to the Death Bite, but going to go off here with his patron, just kind of going to cross his fingers and hope that this board stays up. But we know it's not. It's guaranteed not. <laughs> he is going to get the unfortunate news uh, that it, there is a Brawl coming, but I'm with you. I think Oskaka is putting the read on his opponent's hand as something fairly similar to his hand. It's just mm. like, okay, he's just got patrons and combo pieces and situational cards, and he's waiting for his turn to go off. So I totally agree with you. I think that Fiery War Axe was a good play expecting patron, but now he gets the news that he's playing against Control Warrior with Brawl. And I'm just like just watching Oskaka's face there for a reaction, maybe to see if he, he was surprised by the presence of that brawl in his opponent's he deck. He was not. He's he, just he, a poker he, face. Yeah, if he was, he hid it very well, but he now has the information that he has the uphill climb here of trying to defeat a control warrior with this deck after getting his initial patron wave uh, dealt with. Yeah, and not only did it get cleared, but we see on the right side of Morgulla's <laughs> hand, yeah. just a car. I mean, that could just lock out the game the next turn. And if it doesn't, you see it right after that. So this is looking really bad for Oskaka in this situation. And I honestly don't know what he does here. You no. know, you've what? just no. used one of your win conditions. You've got another patron. Frovins don't have the same impact they once had without mm -hmm. the charge. You know, you've got Dr. Boom and you've got uh, Grom, for example, but Control Warrior deals with those threats so easily with executes, big game hunters already sitting there ready. So yeah, like you said, Justica, start healing for everything, start building up that armor, and then you just go out of reach of what the Patriot can do to you. Yeah, it's one thing if you've got your Control Warrior opponent scrambling a bit, if you've had a good tempo start with kind of, you know, minion into minion into Dread Corsair into Shredder or something like that, um, and you've managed to beat up the, the Control Warrior a little bit, then suddenly your cards like Dr. Boone and Grom become much more threatening because they're having to scramble to deal with it and do desperate things. When you play Justicar on turn six um, and you're, you're still well above 20 life, 23, um, you're in a pretty comfortable position to not even have to panic about those late game threats. I love this play by Morgulad, by the way. I mean, he could have gone for the really safe play by going for Fire War X and then into the Sludge Belcher, which he just pick up. But he says, no, I'm not afraid. I'm just going to play the, the Jessica here. It sets him up so well for future turns. Basically, next turn, he can go slam Belcher and tank up. Everything looking great for Morgulad here. I love how he's not afraid to just play out the Jessica right now. Yeah, absolutely. You have to pick your pick your point to take that tempo loss of playing the Justice card. You, you will probably suffer a loss of tempo on the turn you play it due to the three health on a six mana minion. Um, but as you said, long term investment. You know, next turn did quite possibly look like Slam Belcher Hero Power, and it still looks pretty good here. Um, and I think for the for the future turns, there will be a lot of uh, plus Hero Power at the end of his decision making. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, just snowball your life out of control. Yeah. You know, don't give Oskaka any kind of opportunities to do any damage to you, uh, the longer he can sustain, the easier time he'll have fishing out those options out of his deck. An extra brawl, for an example. Uh, Revenge, obviously, not going to have much effect at this point. But yeah, this is it now. So Morgala can just sit back, press the hero power, just react every now and then, get all the answers he needs. So Oskak is going to have to do a lot of work to get back in this game. Yeah, he's going to have to put something together very soon to generate another patron board, but looking at his hand, he's so far off doing that. It's sat on a, an execute and not much else going on right now. No battle rage in sight, no cycle. And uh, it's been talked about at great length in various tournaments, but top decking as patron is not a position you want to be in. Exactly. I mean, you can't get anything going. Basically, the more cards you can draw, the more cards you can draw on top of that yes. because of Battle Rage and all those things. And Morgul just kind of go out and play out his Yusser after seeing that execute. And not having cards to the patron is almost doubly bad in the situation because Morgul can just go ahead and use all his removal because he knows unless it's you know top deck into top deck, you're perfectly fine. You're not going to be dying into anything. Absolutely. Um, so that execute that was the one card left in his hand is reasonably useful here, but it doesn't <laughs> doesn't get him anywhere close to coming back <laughs> into this game. Takes four damage to, to kill something, right? Right. It's like it's an eight mana tempo swing that literally doesn't matter in the course of the yeah, game because exactly. he doesn't have the resources to fill out the rest. And there's one threat, right? This yeah. warrior drops a uh, Ysara, gets a card, it dies. He yeah. shrugs, then he plays whatever else he has in his deck. Right. Barons, do, uh, Dr. Booms. Right. It's such a, a horrible spot for us Kaka to be in because, like you said, you don't want to be in a situation where you're top decking answers for the Control Warrior because once the Control Warrior is sitting there comfortable in the driving seat, <laughs> he can do what he wants. He can have some fun uh, at that point. So, yeah, it's looking pretty oblique for Oskaka at the moment.
Oscar going to take a risk here and just play out this death spite. He basically knows that the only way he can possibly win this game is if he gets something right here in this next draw. And somehow that allows him to snowball a situation. Maybe he gets, you know, an Acolyte or a Patron and then you get a Battle Rage and just card after card. And somehow he's able to bring out this victory. But, I mean, it's it's basically grasping his draws at this point. It really is. Um, Battle Rage is definitely a key component of any kind of you know, 1% chance of a comeback here. It will involve the card Battle Rage. Um, so yeah, the Death Spite setup would definitely activate something like Acolyte, which would then give you multiple chances to hit the Battle Rage and you'd be able to draw two more, more, two more cards. So. I think 1% is a bit generous. Let's be honest. 1% probably is a bit generous. Yeah. I think it is too, I don't yeah. really want to go into decimals, but if we, if we were being accurate, it's probably a lot less than that, yeah. And double Nightmare as well. So uh. Mo Gallad has a quick way to finish the game off if he chooses. And now Isara is going to generate another card. Delt just stands there just like, you know, even your Death Spite I doesn't mean, deal with me. I'm looking at the BM finish from Morgulot here. Does he go for the Nightmare, Nightmare BGH's own guy to finish the game off? And I mean, he's he's a psychology. What was it? A PhD in psychology? Yeah. 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 So I mean, get in the mind of Oskarka. <laughs> Show him who's boss. Oh, some glorious things can happen here. If that if that uh, Gromash hits the board, then we can do some some crazy Sylvanas things to steal the Grom. We can nightmare things <laughs> and BGH our own minions. There's a pretty good chance that this game is about to end in a fairly spectacular fashion. Yeah, is there lethal here with this Grom? I think there is with the Sylvanas. Sylvanas, Yastera. Yeah, Sylvanas. Yastera's Awakens, yes. plus Nightmare and Nightmare. How much damage is that? I feel like that's enough. Yeah, that's definitely enough. Uh, is it? Well, because he's five from the Yastera's Awakens, so it's 20. already 15, plus another 10 on top of that, so it's 25. Yeah, 25. Yeah, right. yeah, this is a fun way to do it, right? <laughs> uh, this isn't going Wait, to gonna, be Maybe you just BM? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So I'm not putting okay. up with this. Okay, right. Right. So I don't think I don't think that ends up being lethal the way he did it. But I guess if you make your opponent concede with the play that you make, then that is lethal. This so. is where this PhD is coming. It's like I know I can win, yeah. but I don't need to win. Let's just do something crazy and get him to concede the game. So the first match is going to go to what we consider the underdog in this matchup at the moment. Control Warrior is off the board now. He doesn't have to look at that ever again. Hopefully in this matchup. And uh, yeah, so what does Oskaka need to do now going forward? Does he just pick the same deck or do you feel like there's something in that lineup he can match up well against? I mean, there's a reason why he went for the patron, right? If he felt like it was good against the entire lineup of his opponent, so I imagine just going to go for that again. I mean, even if he was expecting that to be patron, that's 50-50 at best. So I really think he's just going to go for the same thing. We'll see what Morgulot has to bring out. Yeah, if you look at what's left, Hunter and Druid, most most uh, accomplished patron players feel pretty comfortable against Druid. It's a matchup that you can lose if they get a really strong pressure draw early. But especially since we saw uh, Oskaka had Belchers in his patron deck, or at least one Belcher mm. that we saw being played. So that'll help out against Druid as well, just for a bit of extra... Uh, minion presence on the board and insurance against the the combo at the end of the game. So I would I would be I would be pretty heavily expecting just the the patron requeue here from Oscar. What do you think of the hunter? So Orange has had some success with hybrid hunter recently, and hunter's kind of in a, a bad spot since League of Explorers didn't really get anything to help it. Uh, are you expecting a kind of Orange esque hybrid hunter or maybe a mid range hunter? Trump did play mid range hunter on ladder, find some success with it. Yeah, I think Trump himself even admitted that he didn't really feel that deck was good, even though even <laughs> even though he was winning with it. Um, I would expect it to have some charge minions in it. Let's put it that way. Exactly how far down the scale we go towards Face Hunter, whether we move past Hybrid Hunter, you know, exactly like what we're describing when we use those terms. All of those things are up from, for debate, but I expect it to be an aggressive hunter. He's a high main, right? If it's got a high main and yeah. Arcane Golem, it's it's hybrid, right? Yeah. It doesn't have so any high I, mains. I'm playing 28 face cards and two high mains. Is that, does that mean I'm playing Hybrid Hunter? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, we already see that he has Shaman and Control Warrior in his lineup. Maybe mm -hmm. he just has some crazy deck to play games with Maybe. his opponents. Yeah. I mean, could definitely be anything as well. I mean, the Druid, again, we were talking about maybe aggro before, maybe just something off the wall. Maybe it's Egg Druid. Mm -hmm. You know, it's definitely a possibility, to, uh, considering what we've seen so far. Was not con expecting Control Warrior at all there. Uh, no, me, me either. Huge surprise to me. So, yeah, I, I'm willing to be surprised again. <laughs> so, if he wants to throw something else crazy at us, then come on, you, you throw it out. I want Egg Druid, and I want, like, Control Hunter, you know, with, like, Wild Pyro and Hunter's Mark. Explosive Shot. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Steam Weedle Sniper. <laughs> yeah. I want that. That's what I want. Okay. Just, I'm not just gonna Finley, get it. Finley into Justicar into tank up, just fatigue hunter all the way. Fatigue <laughs> hunter, <laughs> man. <laughs> so yeah, so these guys are probably making decisions on decks. I wonder who's making the long decision here when you when you decide to deck. You know, you have time to consider matchups, I suppose, but 
it's blind, right? You don't know what they're going right. to bring. And the one thing that Morgala did against Oskaka, he kind of threw the control war out there. And I don't think he expected it. He was just like, oh, like what other surprises has this guy got for me? Control right, hunter, I mean, right? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if still, like, what was it, five or six turns into that game, he still thought he was playing against Patron. That would not surprise me at all if that was the case. Um, I think, yeah, Control Warrior will be a surprise to most people if they come up against it in this tournament. I certainly wasn't expecting to see a lot of Control Warrior in this tournament. I don't know about you. Well, Control Warrior is pretty strong, especially against what Oskaka has brought here. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, a lot of players are playing those meta decks, you know, like Holy Fountain, like all the strong decks right now. And you kind of counter the counter in certain ways. And maybe, maybe Morgoth was expecting to get far in this tournament. And that if he gets far enough, he can start playing pros that brought up, have brought anti aggro decks. Putting that PhD to work, <laughs> okay, get, getting the psycholo psychological, uh, psychological side of the game, excuse me. So a PhD in psychology is almost a PhD in Hearthstone, right? Yeah, sure. Let's go with that, indeed. <laughs> and so we do see Oskaka has requeued the patron here, as we expected, and it's going to come up, come up against Druid, which uh, it's a matchup that people have some discrepancies on exactly how they rate it, but the one thing that's universally agreed on is if patron gets a strong patron generation draw, the Druid just tends to get blown out of the game. Exactly. And one of the things that Druid can do is basically tech in at Harrison Jones to be able to shut down, shut that down right away. And we can maybe see what Morgulad has teched into this deck by looking at his mulligan. And we're playing the mulligan game again, yep, guys. We really are. <laughs> we are. What Druid is this going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Egg and Druid. Looks like Morgulad actually ended up blinking first that time, and Oskaka chooses to go with the full mulligan. You know, one thing My I was reason. seeing wow. a couple of weeks ago was mind control tech showing up a lot mm -hmm. in Druid. Like, even two of them, no shades, like, two mind control techs. Does that, do you think that makes an impact in this matchup specifically? It helps. Um, the problem is, against the early patron generation turn, mind control tech just locks up too much of your mana um, to really have additional answers. You know, if you could do mind control tech plus swipe or something earlier in the game, um, yeah, that, that would make a lot of sense. But like against turn five patrons, if you, mind control tech, hero power, probably not going to be enough to deal with that devastating board that you face down. By the way, I want to talk about this turn. You see Oskaka has, I mean, he's obviously going to play the Fire War X, yes. but I like him not playing right now because if you play the Fire War X and then kill the Darnassus and sit there and wait, it tells your opponent that you have Dread Corsair. He's considering whether or not to play it right now, and he wanted to make that decision before he played the Fire War X lest he give information away. Absolutely. And I mean, this also plays into the thing we're talking about, where it just Oskaka seems to be just playing very slow and considered in this tournament. Um, but like you said, if you're going to stop and think, that is definitely the correct way to do it. Don't play cards first and then stop and think about the rest of your turn because you give unnecessary information away to your opponent. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. You don't want them to think you have other decisions after you've made your initial decision. If you kind of hold out, play the one card and pass, like, oh, he has nothing else. Good mind game. So, good news, bad news situation here from Oskaka. <laughs> good news. His opponent has hero powered him in the face multiple right. times as Druid. We haven't seen Innovate, we haven't seen World Growth. Um, uh, just a Darnassus Aspirant that's been taken out, followed by hero power on turn three. Bad news, all four weapons are currently <laughs> sat in his hand, which does not give him a huge range of options. But what's better, all four weapons or no weapons? I kind of like having the weapons I would take hand. all four over zero yeah, <laughs> yeah. any day. He's pretty much become a blacksmith at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how many weapons he's got. But he does have other things going on as well. It's, like I said, he has that Dread Course that's come down if he needs a bit of protection. Acolyte will find him some cards eventually. You probably won't see it till after a Despite Charge is gone. And Dot the Boom for later. And the one thing uh, in the previous matchup we saw is Tice had his minions grinded out, didn't he? He just got grinded out by the Druid. He just kept removing minions. And then it got to a point where Tice just had nothing else to play. So that could be a strategy you could go for if this goes into kind of a long trading game, which it probably will be if you have four weapons. Yep. Um, so yet again, we can see like the big consideration oh. for Tice this, uh, for Oskaka this turn, sorry, was again, whether or not that Dread Corsair came down and we saw him sat and use the rope for the entire turn before doing anything and then choose not to use it. Wow, so we see the Keeper coming in the hand of Morgulot, and I think Oskaka was kind of considering whether he wanted to play this Acolyte of Pain out. Sure. Maybe he wanted to go for the Dread Corsair and Hero Power up. Perhaps he's holding that for when he gets 
you know, um, a Grim Patron later on to make it that much harder to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But obviously we see no Grim Patrons in hand. That's really painful for Os Oskaka, by the way. He really needed that card draw. I mean, yeah. Grim Patrons just win you the game on five sometimes. If you can just go Death Bite into like Inner, inner Rage, into the Swing, Drenoid 4 Patrons, who it needs specific answers to deal with everything. It's very hard to do on five mana or six mana sometimes. But uh, this is where the game gets a little bit more fear on Druid's side, where it kind of balances out a little bit. Sure. And one of the other big underrated uh, perks of Dread Corsair is that if you have a Death Spite equipped, and say you're planning to set up a big Battle Rage turn, it's a card you can hold in your hand that costs zero mana, and just play it and say, okay, that's that's another card. Um, so all of these things were definitely being considered by Oskaka when he chose his timing for the Dread Corsair. Um, but looking at this hand right now, what he needs most is just tempo on the board. So I definitely appreciate him playing the, the Dread Corsair on this turn. Yeah, he needed to just get something on the board to deal with the minions coming out yep. from Druid coming up. I mean, obviously, yes, that Execute has picked up the second one here. Not what he wants at all, by the way. I mean, one Execute was enough for him, thank you very much. And basically, I expect to see just a clear of this, uh, as much as he can clear of this Shredder, equip another Death Spite, and then set up for Dr. Boom next turn. Well, I like that. You know, he sets up a weapon to start clearing more stuff that comes from the Druid, and then he has kind of the power play on six with the coin Dr. Boom. So he is getting that kind of tempo he needs. And uh, most of the things in more Galatans Ooh, are minion. Oh, wow. man, that guy. You never want to see that. That's one of the guys you don't want to see. Yeah, apart from the the, the big blowout uh, Shredder outcome, you know, the Chos and the Doomsayers, etc., that can really, like, have crazy effects, Shielded Minibot is just one of the ones you never want to see come out of your opponent's Shredder. Well, yeah, it's one of the best two drops right, in the entire exactly. game. Yeah, not so. a huge surprise, right? Yeah. And this Shielded Minibot alone <laughs> will be able to deal with both the Acolyte, which popped its shield, and the Dread Corsair. Yeah. So, so much value from and that. That, that Minibot is going to have such a huge effect on the game because the fact that he's had to, it's able to trade for both of his minions on the board essentially means he doesn't have enough power in play anymore to deal with that Emperor and coin Dr. Boom. He'll have to use an Execute to make a choice to get rid of it. Or a slam that he just drew, of course, which is probably now a more reasonable option. Yeah, and he's not that close to killing his opponent, so he can't really just drop the Dr. Wu and expect that's <laughs> right. going to get too much. I mean, the, the extra discount on the Druid's minions, on the Druid's cards, excuse me, is way more important than just getting a minion on the board right now, which sounds strange because it's Dr. Boom, but that's just the reality of the situation. And now this gives uh, Morgaland an opportunity to replenish the board. He's dealt with what Oskaka had to, had to, with the Shield and Minibot. I mean, that was amazing for him. And once Dr. Boom comes oh. down... Oh, Harrison oh Jones. Ouch. I was going to wow. say, that was a very interesting line the turn before by Oskaka, choosing to use the Execute. Um, basically valuing an 8 health swing, uh, or a 9 health swing, 5 less to his face and 4 more to his opponent's face over an Execute, which is perfectly reasonable uh, with the second Execute in hand. But the far more important thing right now is that Harrison Jones coming down and shutting down what I believe is the second Death Spite, right? So that yeah. is one of the key whirlwind tools gone out of the deck in a matchup where generating patrons is kind of everything. Exactly. And he's going to basically try to hope that this Dr. Boom can get some work done. Going to go ahead and execute out that Harrison Jones so it can't get a good trade. But I mean, Oscar looking to be in really bad trouble here. I mean, Morgalod could just go for a combo clear. He'd still be in a great shape. He absolutely would. Uh, that swipe top deck is probably going to help him out a little bit. No, it doesn't quite work mana-wise with the Azure Drake Living Roots. Not quite enough there. Could have got a little bit more greedy with the Emperor's. <laughs> oh, damn. Emperor discounting my hand. It still doesn't quite work. Need more discounts. Um, but I totally agree with you. I think clearing this with combo is more than reasonable. Uh, it just... The amount of just value. painful, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's painful, but the amount of value that you'd have left in your hand afterwards with the Drake, the Ancient of Lore, etc., all this stuff to keep you going, you feel like you've been in a pretty com comfortable position, and it's pretty tricky for for your opponent from this point to make a strong patron generation turn when you know you've just destroyed their second death spite. This is a similar situation Tice was in, where he was just having his minions match and cleared, and then he kind of ran out of steam. So he could go for that. Uh, I was thinking, mate, is it worth kind of going aggressive here now you have that? Are you really worried to be killed by the patron at this point? Mm -hmm. Like, he's going for the swipe face, so he puts him down to 17. He's got the living roots and the combo. He draws Ooh. another savage raw. You know, like, he just wins the game. But there's a guy who can burst you down. Yeah, <laughs> Boombots hate Azure Drake, by the way. <laughs> that was yes. basically guaranteed when he went for that swipe. But I think this is really stressful for Morgulad, though. I mean, we've been talking about how he's basically ahead, but you're, you're trying to close out the game. You're going to find a way to not lose the game at this situation because you know you're ahead. And that can be very nerve wracking, speaking from Morgulad's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the aggressive push there from Morgulad. 
it's, it's interesting because he doesn't quite get his opponent in range of the burst damage that he has stocked mm -hmm. up to go. He has 16, 17 with the hero power if he's able to fit that in as well. But he knows his opponent is going to armor up from this position. So uh, it seemed like a little bit of a needlessly aggressive push Ooh. from his part. But now wow. Oskaka has the opportunity to counter swing here and just threaten a lethal of his own with that Grom in a rage. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. I mean, Oskaka could actually just steal this game in this situation. It was looking so bad, but now just swing with the Fire War Axe to face, armor up. You have that inner rage with the with the Grom. Is Oskaka just going to steal this game from Morgulad? It looks like it. It that's, really does. That's really scary. I mean, Morgulad probably is not going to expect it. Uh, although, would a Savage Roar be enough now? I think it would. Well, be. he wouldn't have enough. He wouldn't have enough mana for it. No, oh, it yeah, 10, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But I have to say, like, I think Morgulard has put himself in this position to be able to lose it by taking that that needlessly risky play. You know, there was a good chance, especially because of you said uh, Boombots love sniping down as a drone. <laughs> so there's a good chance he ends that turn with you know no pressure in play, nothing, nothing to establish what a board, and he doesn't even really set up lethal. So you know the play for the board seemed like a more solid line to me. But this is the line he took. He definitely wanted to go aggressive. One one thing to keep in mind though is we obviously can see the card in the hand of Oskaka. We mm -hmm. saw that there was no way to kind of take initiative there. Mm -hmm. But from Morgulad's point of view, maybe if he goes for combo clear, mm -hmm. his opponent just goes double shredder or something like that. So sure. maybe that was in his head. Yeah, that time. Yeah, that makes sense. Just because the show, like, one decision can just decide it all at some point. So, I mean, this isn't going to be enough, right? He's still going to have added uh, the inner rage and the weapon. There's just so much damage. He's just doing the best he can to yeah. deal with the board, but is going to be pretty happy with the aggressive stance <laughs> yeah, from Morgulad wow. there. That's going to be it. I mean, Morgulad just tries to go for the most damage possible, doesn't want to waste a train, but that means that Oskak is going to cruise through the victory here. Going to steal this game away from Morgulad when it seemed like it was basically lost, and that's going to tie up this series. That was absolutely insane of a game. It was a really, really great game, yeah, and I think that is the fastest turn Oskak has played all day. So, <laughs> Grom in a rage, hit face. All right, guys, we're back at 1-1, so he's feeling good about himself again, and now he will queue up looking to go for a 2-1 lead. Yeah, that patron did its work. Uh, we were talking about the matchup. You know, you kind of need that patron and the inner rage and stuff to get that patron board Drew can't deal with. But Oskaka didn't need it. You managed to find the win without <laughs> any patrons at all. Yeah, when you're <laughs> when you're the world champion, maybe you can win with patron warrior without patrons. You know? Right. I mean, he d he had the uh, the the other thing that Druid struggles to deal with, which is just he just had a lot of minions. He got mm. the dread corsair down for tempo early, and Druid was kind of struggling to deal with that, especially because of the really slow start that they had. He missed. He had it done as his aspirant, but that just got immediately dealt with War Axe. He had to hero power on turn three, and he didn't like even have wraths and swipes and things to answer minions from the patron warrior. He just had kind of slow, clunky minions that started at Shredder. And that's why you kind of see some players actually cutting Darnassus Aspirant, because you thought it was just a completely dead card. Yeah. I mean, if he, if that had been a completely different card, even if it was a seven mana cost card, mm -hmm. basically it would have just been hero power pass from Oskok, or maybe he just equips the Fire War Axe and hits the face or something. So and that's why you kind of see the, them cutting it. Obviously, you kind of need it if you're going to deal with aggro, but in this case was pretty much useless. All um, right, so we're tied at 1-1. One, one. Dan has some uh, information on the bracket for us. We're going to go jump to him, and he's going to give you that. Thank you very much, guys, and a good job casting so far. Hope you guys are enjoying this series. Uh, I was cocky able to tie it up and send it to game number three. Happening in the bracket, though, uh, I, I have some bad news for a lot of people who are looking for their fan favorites. Uh, Nyria, the second place finisher of Europe 2015's championship, has also dropped into the lower bracket as he lost his second round. We had a really big matchup earlier in the second round as well. That's the big Titan one. It is Crane, the guy that we were hyping up. He faced off against Kalen and Crane was able to win the series three to one, sending Kalento to the loser's bracket. So while I know a lot of people were cheering for the Ukrainian, who has proven multiple times that he's one of the best players in the world, I think it's time for Crane to get some real notoriety here, as I think I see the cast as my peripherals do a fist pump there for their bro. Uh, also, a couple of other upsets as well. You need from France. He also drops into a lower bracket as well as Zedalot, uh, the very famous Priest player. So I think a lot of people are looking for some of these fan favorites, but they're going to be fighting for their tournament lives really early on. So there's a lot of development. I can't wait to see what happens. Back over to you guys. What do you think? Wow, so Crane gets that massive victory against Kalento. And like you said, some of these uh, pro players are dropping into the lower bracket where it's really tough because one if you lose one match, you're out. So you need to, like... Be consistent. We play more matches as well, which is the tougher part. If you're in winners, if you can just cruise for winners, it's such an easy ride. But once you get into lower bracket, it gets tough. 
Yeah, no, I would like to vehemently deny that I showed any form of bias <laughs> upon hearing the news that Crane had won. No, Crane is a former teammate of mine and a former teammate of yours, amusingly enough, on two separate teams. But there you go. So we, uh, we're both big fans of him as well as good friends with him. So it's, we're happy to see him doing well. It also shows how difficult it is to get through these brackets. There's so many good players, just landmines everywhere. And you don't know if they maybe they, you know, were get were able to get those points through, you know, they basically squ squeaked in or maybe mm -hmm. they've been, you know, grinding out all this time and they're one of the top players on ladder the entire time, just like Crane. I mean he was top five going into this, if I remember correctly. So just landmines all over the place. Even if you're not facing as a pro player, you could be facing a monster. Absolutely. Another thing to consider as well is while the game develops like over time and more players keep coming, it's going to get harder for these guys. Nothing's ever going to get easier from now on. Like We had like an established pro scene at the start of Hearthstone. But if you look at the progress and the growth it's had up until this point, there's so many good players. Yeah. There are just tons of them. And this is just Europe. This right. isn't the world. We're just in a, like, a part of the world right now. So yeah, so the more players that come in and commit to this game, the more upsets there'll be, there'll be kind of like people kind of reaching their peaks. And that really shows who is the best at that right. point because the, they've had to the way play the, less people. The Hearthstone Championship Tour is set up this year. It's to give players who necessarily haven't got the exposure through streaming, through being part of a big organization, it's to give those players as fair an opportunity as everyone else has. You know, you're all on a level playing field. You know, we're, we're essentially scrapping invites to, to HCT point granting tournaments. So everyone starts on the same footing. Everyone starts at the same point in the brackets. You know, the open qualifiers aren't as much as a thing anymore. And um, so it's a huge opportunity to all these sort of players who sit at home and think, you know, they're watching a stream and they're watching, you know, Calento play in front of 50,000, 100,000 people and thinking, you know, I'm just as good as that, as that guy. And I want to go out there and prove it. And like, this is their chance to do that. Yeah, exactly. And you were, you were talking about in the first, before the first match, how there's so many opportunities now with the winter championship, with the spring championship, with the spring, with the summer championship, gives them so many more opportunities to get to that world championship in the end, and also just make quite a bit of money if you're able to <laughs> sure. win this right here. I mean, $100,000 per region, per championship. So that's pretty big money that could possibly earn here. And just giving them so many opportunities. I mean, one player, Surrender from Korea, he had 500 points last year, was unable to make BlizzCon. I mean, we're going to see players like that that have Consistent performances really excel in this format, I believe. Another thing to consider as well, if we have kind of an unknown player as the Winter's Champion, that's a big moment for his career, but it looks like these guys are actually ready to go into the next game. Tied 1-1. Let's see who can take the edge and snag this game. Yep, so we are back on the mid-range Druid for Morgalard. Oskaka looking like a fairly standard oil rogue, unlikely to be miracle since we do see the prep sprint being used as the card draw engine as opposed to something like Gadgetan Auctioneer. Um, Wild Growth and Darnassus Aspirant in the opening hand for Morgulard. So he has options. He'll be pretty happy with that hand. If he can uh, pick up an Innovate as well, just to uh, get that Ancient of Lore <laughs> out a little bit unfairly soon, I'm willing to say, <laughs> uh, then he'll be extremely happy. But honestly, Oskaka's hand is looking pretty great as well. Yeah, but the thing is, in this matchup, I mean, a lot of rogue players like to think that, you know, it's favored for the rogue because they believe right. in their own abilities. All rogue players think every <laughs> matchup for rogue is favored. The that is very is true. Mine. But, I mean, if the druid can get out that get that ramp going early, I mean, we know that rogue is a combo deck, uh, more or less, these days. They don't really like to be doing stuff in the first few turns. They like to be reacting. They don't get stuff going until later. So for druid to get that head start is absolutely huge. We see a ton of ramp in Morgulad's hand, but luckily for him, he does have that card draw, that's exactly what you want in yep. a druid. You want the ramp and then the card draw to keep refilling your hand there. That's a good hand for me. You consider that all that ramp with nothing to play to kind of recharge after mm -hmm. using those ramp tools could be devastating in some situations. If you just had like a wrath or something, it'd be it'd be looking a, a lot worse. Shredder wow. is a, a fantastic <laughs> pick that's, that's not bad. <laughs> that's a good time Shredder right there, but he doesn't go for it. He wants to clear up this Falnos just in case it poses it. And it looks like he's just going for the Mega Ramp. No, I want to get this Ancient Lord down <laughs> as fast as possible. I think he's afraid of maybe a backstab right. Respect SI. Respect backstab for sure. Yeah, so that could have been it. And definitely, I mean, this is really hard for Oskaka to deal with because there's oh. nothing to deal with. Okay, that Violet Teacher um, puts Oskaka in a, what he will probably feel like fairly comfortable at this point, even though there has been the intense ramping from his opponent. He has the opportunity to take a free turn of tempo whenever he wants it from this point onwards, just by going Violet Teacher, 
prep if he even needs it, depending on how much mana he has at the time, and sap just to deal with whatever minion his opponent plays. We could see it on a Shredder. We could even see it on an Ancient of Law, which sounds a little bit ridiculous when you first think about it. It's but so clunky. Yeah, but in terms of tempo, it's actually a really, really clunky card to play. Just get some free free here. I quite yeah. like that. Yeah, it was a really key turning point potentially here for Oskaka because if he goes for the Valet Teacher, yes, I mean, if your opponent swipes and clears it with a hero power, it takes their entire turn, but that's still pretty painful if you're Oskaka because you have no follow-up after that. So Oskaka going for the more safe route here. I'm gonna go for that SI7 agent, just naked on the board, no combo effect, and later he can maybe use his Violet Teacher to greater effect. And I am relatively confident what the outcome of this next turn is gonna be, D2. How do you feel? <laughs> I think we will be seeing the Violet Teacher preps out this turn. It no. could be, but perhaps he's saving it for maybe a 7-drop next turn. <laughs> no, but, he okay, knows. Okay, okay. No, no. I tried to play Devil's Advocate for a second there. It didn't work out. But, no. yeah. We've been talking about Oskaka taking time as soon yeah. as he's just like, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. And yeah. this is really big for him. Like you said, a massive tempo swing having those prep saps against decks like Druid, who have a slow kind of process of building the board because mm -hmm. they go kind of from four to five to six rather than playing a lot of minions. He does get the Ancient of Law here. He does get to recharge his hand. Harrison Jones right. is a big card in this matchup. It is. It's something that we failed to talk about, really. We saw it come up in the, the Patron Warrior matchup, and it's just as effective, if not more effective, against Rogue. Well, against Rogue, the problem about playing against Rogue, though, is that sometimes you're kind of you, know, you basically just have to use it on their hero power, right? And get the two cards there, which is painful for a rogue. But at the same time, you know, you're not getting rid of a big dagger. Usually later in the game when rogues dagger up, when they get a big dagger on board, they're flurrying they on the same They immediately blade flurry, Exactly. Yeah. So this might learn. not be as great, especially because things are so clunky now. And this is what rogue likes to do, whether they're facing a handlock or, you know, basically arena lock these days, or whether they're facing druid. This is the path to victory for the rogue. Just tempoing your opponent out of the game. Morgulite has eight cards in hand, but he I mean, how do you use them? <laughs> no swipe. I mean, swipe's the big one to kind of take this board back. It looks like he's just going to drop Forrest in here. Just squeezing a raft down the free free, that's fine. So he's just trying to be able to reduce his hand cost and just stop playing stuff. But as we know from Rogue, they could just burst you down. So it could be a very dangerous spot for him. Right, and here we see the additional criticism of uh, Darnus Aspirant and another reason why it's been cut from the deck. You know, the, the, the big reason was it's it's easy to mulligan against. You know, you just keep your Frostbolt, you keep your Dark Bomb, you keep your Fiery War Axe. The alternate thing is that you've seen it in this game. Those cards have just sat in his hand, and we're now at a stage where they have zero mm. impact on the game. They're just they're just River Crocolisks essentially, <laughs> without even without even Beast Synergy. Um, Absolutely. So. A lot of people have been favoring more cards like uh, Living Roots in place of that, but he's still going for the Aspirants and maybe regretting it just a little bit right now. Right. The thing is, we've been talking about how Oscock has played this beautifully and he's got himself a lead, but that Thorson going down, that was a really good turn by Morgulot. I mean, it seemed kind of obvious when he did it, but I mean, it's really scary facing down a board like that. Maybe he wants to get more minions down, but it really set him up well, well for next turn. And it has Pseudo Taunt as well, which makes it really difficult to get rid, rid of for Oscock. So he's probably going to be trading a lot of minions in. And this works basically like a swipe, right? All these one ones are gone now. Yeah, that's a good point. He's kind of put a threat down, which he knows Oscock might just use his one ones relieve the pressure, which is what is done at this point. And now he has just finds an innovator as well. Loads of reduced minions. He could just start slamming stuff down. But another problem which you'll encounter is, does he have Blade Flurry? If I commit too much to the board, will uh, will it just deal with it? So yeah, if he really, really wanted to, he could Druid of the Claw, Double Shredder, Donus' Aspirant this <laughs> <laughs> Seems fine. Uh, looks like he's going to go for the Harrison Jones play, try and pick up some additional options. Obviously, doesn't like the look of his hand too much. You know, you mentioned sometimes you have to use it on just the hero power. Honestly, I wouldn't really put the word have into that sentence. Like, it's a five mana Ancient of Lore in that situation. It's yeah. not exactly terrible. <laughs> right, but the nice thing is when you have it on turn five, I mean, you see this all the time. People think, you know, you have to use it on a, a, a weapon that's basically been upgraded, right? Right. But it's really painful for the rogue when you use it on turn five. What I was trying to get out earlier is that we'd already gone through a significant portion of the game. His hand was already pretty sure. full. Okay, yeah, yeah. So at that point, you know, it's just, it's, you're not really getting too much at that point. Your hand's already, you know, feeling pretty good at that point. Yeah, that makes sense. The beauty of the shredders here is they are sticky minions, right? No, they're going to stay to the board. If Blade Flurry does come down, it might actually <laughs> demand a little bit more. But he is just going yeah. for it. After careful <laughs> consideration, he decided that he did, in fact, want to play Druid of the Claw, Double Shredder, Donus Assassin in just the same turn. everything. Oh, man. Wow. Well, that's second Drake. 
So how do you sequence this? Do you just go for the backstab first on the Drew of the Claw? Do you save the backstab for something that comes out of the Shredder? This is going to be a three damage Which blade, blade flurry. flurry. Yeah. Four mm -hmm. damage backstab. On the Drew of the Claw, I think. Because you clear everything on the board that's currently yeah. on cleanly, and then you can deal with the Shredder stuff with the minions you have on board. I yeah, I'm happy with the backstab flurry here, Ooh. just being used to deal with the main shredder body. Going to prep blade Why? flurry. New dagger. He gets to re dagger afterwards, which gives him a chance to take out a shredder drop more efficiently. I guess is the thinking. Right, just maximum. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> now so, those things have been a nuisance for him. He doesn't want any more on the board. <laughs> yeah, this actually going to make a slight difference here if Morgulad picks up something that you know prevents him from playing. I mean, if he picks up something expensive here, it could prevent him from playing everything. Though it might not matter here, considering the massive board of Olskaka right now. Yep. And yeah, very, very uh, smart play there. He, I guess he's recognizing the fact that prep is uh, running out of use a little bit. He doesn't really need to prep sprint while he has this board staring down. So there we go. Wow. Right, just gets an extra 1-1 one, one on the board. Yep. Get, and gets an extra 1-1 one, one on the board and realizes that that board's going to be enough. Doesn't need that that prep after that any longer. So really heads up play by Oskaka. I mean, we're sitting there thinking, he doesn't need a prep, does he? But he's like, this game's over. I'm winning it right now. Yes, exactly. Just use all the resources that you have. He recognized that the game was going to end in the next one or two turns anyway. So just maximize your resources in play. And it did allow him to dagger up and deal with that Mad Bomber that dropped a little bit more efficiently than he would have been able to otherwise. That Violet Teacher did so much that game. Like, not having a swipe, just, wow, that was just so painful for him. And look how much value he got from it. It stuck around right until the end. One ones just were a nuisance. Even like you said, he used the one ones as kind of a pseudo swipe to deal with the forest. And but ultimately, he didn't matter. He just made more of them. Like, they're expendable. And uh, she really showed the power of Violet Teacher in that matchup if swipe isn't available. And it's just one of the things that Druid in general struggles against the most, which is situations that can swing the game completely on its head from you being a minion or two ahead of the board to you being a minion or two behind the board in one turn. You know, we, we talked about it in the Patron matchup, but that's exactly what Patron Warrior is capable of doing. And we saw the exactly the same thing there with the Violet Teacher prep sap turn, which basically just flipped the game on its head. We're also seeing why players like Oskaka, players like Tice have brought these combo decks, which gives them so many options, usually, I mean, when we saw with Tyus, he basically ran out of options. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, when you get all those options in hand, you're able to use your skill in a way that Oskaka has so far in the last two games. You can really come out on top in matchups where, I mean, a lot of times you just falter if you're not as good of a player. And that's the beauty of combo decks. Stuff like Rogue, stuff like Patron, uh, they really... You know, if you're a good player and can make loads of decisions, can make a big good read on your hand and go lots of different routes, it really uh, rewards you for that. Whereas if you're playing a mid-range deck, it might be a little bit obvious what you're doing. Play four, your four drop and then just play your five. Whereas with Rogue and stuff like that, you are really rewarded for making very intelligent decisions. And uh, that's why I like seeing Oskaka play this deck. And that really uh, benefits his talent as a player, I think. He's one of these excellent players that has decision-making that's world-class. By the way, guys, we're seeing a zoo from Oskaka. This yep. is really interesting kind of development here. We saw Sixo with the same thing. Obviously, Sixo loves zoo, but mm -hmm. Oskaka is someone who plays more combo decks, plays more control decks. Right. This is a bit surprising to me, but maybe that's a sign of the times. You know, you can't just play Reno and expect to get wins in this situation. Maybe zoo is the more is the smarter choice in the situation. I was going to say, I'd be very interested as to whether Oskaka just keeps this hand for consistency. It is a one, two, three going first, so it, one of the big things with Zoo is consistency. It's one of the reasons why Peddler was such a strong card coming into Zoo, because that card on its own almost gives you a full curve at the right. start of the yeah. game. Um, so it just allows you to be so much more consistent opening, and he does choose in the end to keep the Abusive Sergeant just to have a solid 1-2-3 opening. And we're finally going to see the Tarnassus actually be pretty useful. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why you have it in the deck, to be able to deal with more aggressive decks here. And I'm pretty sure Morgulah is going to be pretty happy to see this, uh, it, this Abusive Sergeant come out here right away. If he was facing something different, maybe his hand wouldn't really fit that situation. The Liver Roots are a nice answer to this. Uh, if he didn't play Liver Roots, if he maybe put the uh, Aspirant down, he could have played the, uh, the Haunted Creeper, run the 2-1 into it, and then it could be dealt with by the Haunted Creeper the next turn. But right. being able it to also, just it would also one make your, sorry, it also make your Aspirant vulnerable to a Direwolf Alpha immediately with the chance of losing it, if that's in his deck. So he's letting these 1-1s one deal with this first, and then maybe uh, create a safer board state for that to stick around to get that ramp, because that's the big issue of it, right? Sometimes it just doesn't do enough because it doesn't stick around. Absolutely. Um, he has a decent opportunity here. It's a, it's a pretty good looking aspirant, but... You, you could just go for a five drop right now. You could just play claw, a five right? drop right now, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Which, which I was about to say, looks a little bit more consistent and uh, 
plays around a lot of things that Zoo will be wanting to do this turn. Like uh, power overwhelming on any death rattle minion is always something that they're looking out for. So even Where using power overwhelming to trade up into an aspirant there would be a play that the Zoo player was probably fine with. Um, but power overwhelming, not quite enough reach to get through here. Um, and even Imp Gang Boss, which is the natural curve play, just gets immediately contested by this board. Right, and we were looking at Oskaka's, you know, basically initial hand, the one that he kept in his mulligan, and saying, oh, it looks pretty nice. I mean, Abusive Sergeant, a bit weak, but other than that, you have one, two, three. Your two and three mains are really annoying to deal with, but Jura just plays a four, six taunt in turn two. What can you do? Yeah, just so Jura things, right? one, two, three looks like you have the perfect curve, but it turns out that one, five is actually, <laughs> quite, it's actually a little bit better. Just a little bit, yeah. And the Druid Claw just slows down so, uh, Oskaka so much. And like you said, if played around overwhelming, he needs to like double overwhelming or overwhelming abusive. And now Oskaka's sitting there with a one-two. The Druid's still gonna, probably gonna get maybe two free for one, which is gonna be a massive swing mm. uh, for the Druid player. So it's interesting. He could choose to just develop the power overwhelming this turn, play Imp Gang Boss, have a pretty competitive looking board. You know, he, he, we, we said he'd fight his so way back on pretty successfully at that point, but how greedy could he possibly get for the power overwhelming value on that egg? I don't think you can really get greedy with against Druid because Druid is really all about tempo. Obviously, right. they're playing a lot of minions, but you know, having those those ways to ramp up, having ways to just cheat the mana with Innervate, I mean, you really need to just grab the tempo away from Druid or else they're they're in business. If they're able to use their, their removal along with their minions to kill yourself, they're in a good spot. But if you're in a situation where they have to use their kind of clunky moves to deal with your board, then then you have them in a good spot. Oh, well. man. Swipe would just be devastating at this point. Does he find it? No. no. Shredder's pretty good, but Drake is just going to fish him. Another card. And there's the swipe. He just missed it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I mean, it's likely that he's he'll be he'll be more happy just to have that card in his hand in general than of being to miss it that specific turn. He knows that that card at some point in this game is going to be really, really effective. It's going to hit the implosion. That's, that's right. where it's going to be really effective. Ooh. Doom Guard. Jam Doom Guard say go. I mean, it's possible, right? That's That Drake needs dealing with it. You're, sorry, that Drake needs dealing with, and your board doesn't do it particularly efficiently right now. Um, so just playing the Doom Guard for pure tempo should be a consideration, but it looks like he is just going to go for the Peddler turn here. The problem with going Doom Guard is you really need to get something good in the following turns, or yeah. else you're kind of just falling flat. I mean, it's really hard for Druid to deal with, but once they do, and if you have nothing to follow up with, you're kind of in a really rough spot. So I do like going for this. Unfortunately, doesn't get either a pit power bombing or that abusive sergeant help him out with these trades. Yeah, pretty unlucky. Also, abusive sergeant, even something like Elven Archer is at least vaguely effective, but he, no sources of damage here at all. Just uh, three pretty mediocre looking one drops. Yeah, they're not the best guys to be finding. I like him actually going for the Peddler because he can drop his hand before the Doom Guard. So if he draws something that isn't that important, he gets kind of a nice Doom Guard off the back of a board he's developing now. And, you know, the egg's going to stick around. Right. Uh, at, 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 unless it gets silenced. Right. Uh, he goes for the Blood Imp. Not something you see uh, very often. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. But, like, as you said, the risk of this play here by playing the Peddler is if you do whiff like we saw him whiff there, Suddenly, Swipe becomes devastating, but I guess he has the read that Swipe was perfect last turn. So if your opponent has Swipe in hand, it's only one of two possible cards, which is the card they drew off the Drake and the card they top deck on this turn. Oh, so wow. he's made the decision not to play around Swipe here, and he is going to get absolutely blown out of the game because of it. Well, you could argue that going for the Blood of was like kind of a half measure to play around Swipe sure. to make sure something got out of range, but unfortunately, it went on the egg, which is the last thing you wanted to land on. Yep. Um, but he is going to be able to use the Doom Guard this turn, probably to deal with that with that Drake. I find it unlikely that this Doom Guard just goes face. And Abusive Sergeant is actually a nice pickup because he gets to uh, put a little bit of pressure on, deal with the Drake, push three to face. And actually, after what looked like an incredibly back-breaking swipe, he's still in a fairly stable position on the board. Swipe number two would be devastating. <laughs> <laughs> swipe number two goes, oh, man, that sucks. But, you know... He can, he can still come back after this, right, Oskaka? He gets two draws now. Mm -hmm. but he gets some uh, stable bodies down. I like uh, Force of Nature here. Just like, he's, on, he's got no cards in hand. Just get rid of the board. The 1-1's not going to be enough. Bran uh, is not going to be enough either. He might have to find something a bit more. Oh, there's the implosion we talked about earlier. How do you feel about Oskaka's chances now going against this kind of hand the Druid has? I mean, I agree with you. It's ripping, say, Dr. Boom off the top that turn, if it's a card in his deck, it probably isn't. Most Zoo decks are cutting Dr. Boom these days, but he really did need a big power turn. You know, Minion Argus, something like that. But 
just Bran alone on the board, unless he gets a strong battle cry here. That's, that's a battle a, cry. That's reasonable. It's a reasonable draw. Um, Defender of Argus, something like that, probably would have been better. But Loatheb is one of the biggest things in his deck, and that's what he wants oh. to be drawing right now. Do you play the Flame Imp? Do you uh, do want to take a fireball? damage to your face? That's basically a tiny pit lord. <laughs> it's a fireball, right? Just fireball, fireball through your face. face. Yeah. Sounds pretty good, but uh, no, this is just really bad for us, Kaka. I mean, I think Morgulad answered your question last turn, Aqua Blood Bice. I mean, how good was it? What the situation is? Who's going to win this game? Morgulad says, all right, Angel Lord off the top. Just slam it right down. Not afraid at all. Just play that card out. Mm -hmm. So many options in his hand. He's got so many minions as well. That Innovate's going to help uh, as well. He can drop like Forest of Treader. He can even ping something with a Keeper. <laughs> Uh, the innovate's not going to help this turn because it oh, costs no. 10 mana. The, yeah, the low, the low feb, yeah. <laughs> as the low feb has been played, I was mentioning that. But yeah, 10 mana. He could 10 mana innovate into nothing. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm just a big fan of Brand Lower Feb. I think it's one of the most amusing things <laughs> in Hearthstone. You just look at your hand and it's like, okay, my spells are fairly ridiculous right now. You wanted the ice block? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about this play, just going for the Thorson here? I mean, Morgulad has kind of favored that the entire time. As we see, the, the Knife Jaguar implosion, that could turn the game around. But what do you think about just going with killing off the Lothab and going for double Shredder in that instance? Uh, I think that would have been better. It's a more secure board. The, the Emperor isn't doing a great deal for you. You've already used one Force of Nature. So it's not like you're, you're on the combo game plan here. You're really on the tempo board presence game plan. And dropping two Shredders is uh, one of the most oppressive boards that you can put down. I mean, he's got a nice way to recharge the board here. Knife juggle into implosion is a, a way he can do it as well. So I was going to say, how greedy do you get? Do you just fling it at the Lothib and hope you get perfect knives and clear <laughs> yeah. the entire board? Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> n knife juggler, shoot emperor for four, and then all four knives hit minions. <laughs> that is a board clear, and you get to keep a 5-5. Five -five. We see he did roll four. That is pretty huge, especially because, like he's mentioned before, no second swipe in the hand. Mm -hmm. And Morgulan might be kind of regretting his decision to go for the kind of greedy Emperor last turn. Yeah, Double yeah, Shredder would have been a very different situation. So I believe Bran was the other minion that he traded into, right, on yes, that turn? Yes. So, uh, it, you know, it may just be fear of Bran. A lot of people do respect that card very heavily, the things that Zoo can do with it, with Abusive Sergeant, Defender of Argus, for example, even Gormok can just ruin your life when, <laughs> with Bran in some situations. So he may have been respecting it, maybe a little bit more than he needed to based on Oskaka's low resources. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I think I would have liked to see the double Shredder play that turn. Although the Innovate is going to let him play a Shredder as well now. Mm -hmm. So he does develop a very strong board after that. Uh, even though that was a nice uh, clear from Oskaka, he's still steering down yet another Bear, another Shredder, a 2-4 can clear 1-1s. One and that's not a draw you want to see at this point. It's not. And he hasn't had great pedals so far. Uh, he's going to need to pick up something pretty juicy off this one if he's going to stay competitive on this board. Power Overwhelming would be the dream here. But again, it looks like just three mediocre minions. Elven Archer is reasonable in some situations situations not quite high impact enough in this one. What do you think about the decision to not go for a tap first? I feel like he needs to kind of figure out where, where, he's, where he is with the extra card coming to his hand first. I mean, he can't just stop tapping as well. I mean, he, he did sure. eventually go for the tap. I mean, essentially, they both draw you a card for two mana, essentially. Um, yeah. But like, wh what you're saying is once you have your card from your deck, you have full information as to like which peddler card is going to be good. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And what you can do for that turn, right, with the mana you've got left. Yeah. And the thing with Oskaka now, he's kind of in the danger zone. He's at 14. Uh, so he's in a situation now where he can just be comboed without anything on board. So he just has to like just hope. Voidwalker, protect me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the one free, and the other archer's gonna snipe face. Just, all just I can attack do. the face. Yeah. At this point, you just hope your opponent doesn't have anything. A force off the top would be lethal here. We'll see if uh, Borgolod can pick it up. Yeah. So he has 13 damage right now as we stand. Um, so that wrath is makes it just a little bit off. I believe six damage plus six from the savage rule plus hero power is 13. He has the wrath to clear out the taunt. So I believe we're one off. He has a draw as well for the wild growth. That might find him another savage draw. Sure. So like yeah, let's it. do it. All right, let's start the turn with Wild Growth and see where we go. Yeah, he, we need, he has a lot of mana to use what he has in hand. He's already gotten that Thorison off. I mean, Oskaka actually through all of this, he's gotten Morgulad pretty low. So he has a, still an outside chance, even though it felt like Druid's kind of taking this game the entire time. Oskaka has an outside chance, so Morgulad has to be really careful here. For sure. If, if uh, Oskaka can survive this turn, then he has he he has the opportunity to, to force Morgulad to make a defensive play, which then plays back into Zoo's hands. 
Uh, we see he does choose to Wrath for one here, which is interesting that he led with that as opposed to the Wild Growth card. Yeah, it's interesting. I would rather do the, the Wild Growth first and then have a look if the Wrath can be used to clear the one free or maybe sure. clear the four four. So yeah, Earl loves roping. He's going to have to pick up a card here and make a decision quickly or Earl's Oskaka could take the game this following turn. And that appears to be oh, another second Wrath. wrath. Okay, I thought it was Swipe as it came off the top, which would have been glorious, but... Wrath is okay, but as I said, this means since he didn't pick up Lethal... Oh! oh! Wow. Well, uh, that could be good for him. Yeah. That's that probably is good for him, actually. Well... Yeah, the fact that he has Dr. Boom sat in hand, it's probably pretty good for him, but... There's no really real way for Oskaka to win here unless he had no. Power Roaming plus Doom Guard. So we'll probably just see Triple Trade into the Shredder this turn and pass. Yeah, exactly. That was that was a really good drop for Morgla. Just really unfortunate for Oskaka. Typically, when it drops like that on your turn, you're kind of it's a bad situation. But right here, it's awesome. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he was in the sit like most of the time. You see Doom say like, "Ah, oh, damn." But now, now you reset the board and then you play Doctor Boom. The I really, really important thing this turn though is that Morgulard positioned his pilot Shredder correctly, so that if his Shredder dropped a Dire Wolf, it would buff his Doomsayer that was going to blow up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go. Doctor Boom comes down. And now Oscar has to deal with this, and he just can't, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, unless there's some sort of tech BGH, even then the Boombot just kill it, because obviously the Boombots are BGH's natural predator. But this is looking like the beginning of the end, or maybe just the end of the end for Oskaka here. There's a power of Doom Guard, by the way. That could have won in the game last turn. Certainly could. Um, even in the dream scenario where uh, cards didn't get discarded here, he's still a little bit off lethal. So uh, this is looking pretty unfortunate. Might be uh, Voidwalker Prey, but that seems <laughs> unlikely. Yeah. Please, little Voidwalker, well, protect please. me. Yeah, so one seven taunt. Please go. I, I don't. Even with any Boombot hit, I don't think he can possibly win with the Voidwalker. Just, I guess a oh, fun, right. a fun so puzzle. Yeah, trade, trade, both hit face for one, you hero power, yeah. and then you have seven. Yeah, you're right. So yeah, there's no way Voidwalker saves him. Uh, oh, although he's put his faith in it. The Boombots can hit the other minions though, right? And then it's then you can possibly survive. Oh, he can trade with the uh, Doomguard here, but he's dead on board if he goes face. Pretty sure. Mm, no. Oh, wait, no, because the Boombots can, can hit can the miss. other minions. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But it's going to be over anyway because of yes. that Savage Roar and the Swipe. And Morgul is going to take it to a game five. I think it's the first one today. Am I? No, we had one in the first Six match. The first, the first game was 3-2. Yeah. Wow, so, you know, these uh, kind of unknown players are really matching up against the pros, you know, giving them a run for his money, tied 2-2. Two, two. So it's anyone's game. We've got a Hunter coming up next, which have, is going to yeah. be very exciting because we don't see Hunter much anymore. And then we've got the Zoo. So Hunter, depending on what Hunter... If this is Face Hunter, Zoo's going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, classic representation of the Hunter versus Warlock matchup is that it's very, very Hunter favored for the simple reason that both people's hero powers are trying to kill the same person. Um, so they just match up very, very nicely. Uh, Face Hunter in particular against Zoo is just such a favorable matchup because, again, the combination of the damage you can output, the combination that Life Tap and Flame Imp and things like that damage themselves, but also just Explosive Trap just ruins Zoo's life in a lot of situations. Yeah, definitely. But if it is the mid-range Hunter, they take a little bit more time to get onto the board. And as we know, Zoo just gets on the board right away. I mean, basically, what Face Hunter does, if they can get the board for just a couple seconds by turn three, they can just direct everything to Face afterward and do so much damage. But if it is the mid-range Hunter and the Zoo is able to take board control, I mean, minions on the board, they deal damage for free. You don't have to use any mana. One thing to consider as well, Hunter, especially competitive Hunters, is they do like to mix up those traps, regardless of what type of Hunter it is. So he could surprise us. He could have, say, an explosive and a freezing, or maybe a freezing and a bear. So well, one thing's for sure, there is definitely a freezing trap. And just looking at these three cards, if, if you were gonna if you're gonna put money on the hunter right now, you'd say this is straight up mid-range hunter. There's a possibility that it's still a fairly aggressive hybrid build, but all three of those cards seem fairly indicative of just mid-range hunter. Yeah, expecting this to be mid-range hunter looking at that and basically looking at his overall lineup. I imagine that the shaman was the only thing that was very su basically super aggressive, going with the you know two mid-range decks, had the control warrior and the basically the face shaman, just to throw the opponent off as much as possible. And it's going to be interesting to see what the mulligans are. Going to be playing the mulligan game once more, it seems. Both players taking their time with this. And for Oskaka, I think you just get rid of everything. Maybe keep the owl for something like a mad scientist. But other than that, I think you toss the rest. I like keeping the owl, especially for something like Haunted Creeper. That guy, if that guy sticks around. And if this is 
kind of the classic mid range hunter. You don't, and it's definitely looking like it now with that web spinner. Yeah, I think you we, don't want a hand master. Away, but yeah, I love early owl against uh, hunter as zoo because it just trades one for one with every two drop in their deck, right? Mad scientist, horny creeper, and knife juggler. It trades one for one with all of them. Right, so this is going to be very important for both players to try to get that early board. Oskaka already has a pretty good amount of information by seeing that web spinner on the board, so yes. that really changes how he's going to play this matchup going forward. Does he go for the coin knife juggler? We see that Morglot has an answer in his hand and has the animal companion uh, after that, won. so this is what you want to see as a mid-range hunter, just to have something early to contest the board, then later on you have your powerhouse minions. Yeah, it looks here like the mid-range hunter will be ahead on tempo for at least the first few turns. Looks to me like the way this game is going to develop is we're going to see Knife Juggler come down, it's going to get quick shot, and then an additional minion is going to get played. And we'll probably see Animal Companion and the Hunter's Mark used for tempo just to consolidate the board. And we'll see if the game does play out like that. Obviously, things like you know the top decks of these opponent, the, these players for the next few turns can change that. Uh, but this turn, at least, seems like a fairly straightforward quick shot turn. Although, and the information that Oskaka's got now is he knows he can use his hero power a little bit now. He knows that he's not going to be racing. Right. He, he can kind of slow things down if he needs to, and that'll be important for him Ooh. to keep regenerating the board. It's not what he wants to see at all. Do you just use this Iron Beak Owl to get something on the board? Obviously, he trades one for one with that web spinner, but that might not be too bad considering tapping here and maybe something else gets you know sniped off by the Hunter's Mark could be really devastating for Oskaka. I don't see too much merit in playing the Iron Beak Owl because I think like best case, well, you know, best case scenario, it trades with a 1-1 and not much happens. Worst case scenario, you give your opponent something to do. You know, mm -hmm. What if they don't have a curve play right now and Web Spinner gives them something to develop after they trade it up? Oh, sorry, it'll be silenced, so that's nonsense. <laughs> but it can possibly give it, say if they have uh, Eagle Hornbow in their so hand, it can give them a turn right. three so just to really trade with them. Yeah, that, Eagle know, Hornbow into Houndmaster or something like that, right. then you're out of control, right. and then you're like, well, I want to silence this now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel the Owl has more value. Now you know it's mid-range hunter. You can yeah. silence high master targets, high main. If it comes to that, if you feel you need to clear high main, uh, silence and overwhelming will be two cards, which will be very important to deal with that card. Uh, is he is roping, he's kind of considering, I think he's going to go for the Owl, so he does go for the play there. Yeah, the thing to consider here is that obviously you'd like to Owl something more powerful like the high main that you mentioned, but a lot of times getting out you know, getting out the tempo early on can allow you to have a board which can then deal with the high man later on in the game because things can really snowball if you don't t pick up the tempo early on in the game. Sure, I just, I, I just value the life tap there really highly more than anything because what was his intention to do this turn? You know, if, by tapping on the previous turn, he doubles his chances to hit something like Imp Gang Boss. He doubles mm -hmm. his chances to pick up another one drop that then he can at least play alongside that abusive sergeant and have a couple of minions in oh, play. No. By not life tapping here, he's basically yeah. locked himself out of the turn. Just has to drop a one mana abusive sergeant and hope that that is good enough and to contest the Huffer. I mean, it will, like, it, it, unless there's a Misha here. He gets oh, the, oh, double oh Huffer! Oh my god! Double picks. So oh, yeah, man. sure, that Abusive Sergeant is going to trade slowly with the Huffer over two turns, wow. but that second Huffer just comes down now and is, is extremely devastating. Yeah. We were kind of saying, like, mid-range hunter, it's a bit slower now. Uh, he's got some time! <laughs> and then he just rolls double Huffer, like, no, you have no time. <laughs> Yeah, when you can summon a random Huffer, it seems pretty good in this situation. Let's see how many this goes for. It's for three, which is nice and balanced. Everyone's pretty happy with that. <laughs> nothing crazy here. And oh, quick shot. Man. I mean, the one thing going for Oskaka here is that for Mogulab, there's nothing to do unless he picks up something right here. Core Rager's not too bad for him to just play out right on this turn and have something on the board. Otherwise, he's just hero powering and what, Iron Beak Owling? I mean, yeah, let's just go for that. I don't know, I'm kind of not against hitting face that turn because it, like, it changes his, his, his health from odd numbers to even numbers, which is actually very, very important mm -hmm. when you're playing a hunter because it changes the clock on when just your hero power kills them. He does have quick shot though, so that right. could you know alter things a little bit here, but Oskaka is going to need to pull a 6 up from the beginning the first <laughs> series and just really start putting pressure on his opponent's uh, face won. here Yeah, we'll see what he goes for. Although he has slowed him down a little bit just because of his hand, right? He does like he doesn't have a lot going on. Quite reactive stuff. Right. So as long as he doesn't draw a high main, things should be okay for a little while. Yeah, it's what, I mean, honestly, it's why it was kind of okay with just the face hero power play that uh, maybe even developing the owl. I don't know. It's just that you you put your opponent on such a small clock with in combination with that quick shot that you have in your hand. It's like you're basically saying to him, "Can you possibly kill me in the amount of turns that I've given you at this point?" It's the king. He showed up. Uh, high main's going to come down. He does have an answer to it with the power of a Wellman, but the hyenas uh, could stick around. Oh no, Argus is uh, going to be a nice way to respond. But then again, how long can you 
trade in this match, that hero power, like you said, is gonna you know take its toll eventually. What well, do you I think th you should I th do? I think definitely the way Morgulard has played these last few turns out, you know, going for a, a more board focused play on the previous turn and skipping uh, hero power, and then obviously top decking the high main this time, and again skipping the hero power. He's actually given Oskaka a lot more time than maybe he should have to be able to make these board development plays and fight back on the board. Um, so, you know, there, there's a world where he's five health lower right now and suddenly that this this board is just irrelevant. It doesn't really matter what it does because it's not it's not quick enough to race the hero power of the hunter. Um, but Oskaka is going to have to try and seize this opportunity as best as he can and get right back on this board. Right, and the Shredder was a really big pickup actually in this situation for Morgulad to be able to put something on the board without that Shredder, say it was a, a lesser minion or something that he, maybe a Haunted Creeper, then Oskaka can just ignore it basically. Right. But now he has to deal with the Shredder because four damage to the face is damage he cannot be taking. Right, and I want to point out, although I disagreed with the, the first point where he decided to go for the, the board focus style as opposed to the face focus style, I like that he's gone down that line and he's stuck with it. You know, since I brought that up, he actually hasn't pressed hero power. He's gone for board development every turn. Obviously, the high main was a very big help to him be able to do that, Pilot Shredder as well. So he's picked his line. He's going to stick with it. Hopefully, for his sake, it works out well for him. Ooh, this is actually pretty good for Oskaka here. He gets a guaranteed kill. Unfortunately, we weren't able to see the Discover there, but he did get the Power of Woman, which is really good for him to the clear right here. And Oskaka is still at 15 life. He's been at 15 life for several turns <laughs> right. now. Wow. That kill Command would have been good if he'd gone down the Hero Power line of play, mm -hmm. but he needed Hounds at this point, I think. And then he could just push face with the Hounds, maybe get a quick shot off after a Hunter's Mark. Nothing to Hunter's Mark at this point, but it's going to hit that Doom Guard. But yeah, Hero Power pass from the mid range on turn 8 wow. just doesn't feel good. Peddler into Doomguard is absolutely perfect here. He can get that one drop out. Doesn't really matter what it is. Even if it's power overwhelming, you're happy yeah, you to just get that extra damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is absolutely excellent for Oskaka. It's a race now to see what they can get. It looks like we're not doesn't we don't have the graphic again, but it's gonna uh, be a surprise, guys. It's gonna be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers, please. We're just waiting to see what one drop he's going to pick here. I mean, what would be the... I mean, honestly, I feel like Power Overwhelming is one of the best things he can get here. I think that he doesn't have Power Overwhelming if he's taking this right. long to pick, honestly, <laughs> because <laughs> maybe it's like a Clockwork Gnome. Does he Young need Priestess. that? Young Yeah. Like, oh, the problem right. with taking a one-mana minion here is that you fill your board, right? So right. Um, most things that you pick here will get discarded because you're almost certainly playing the Doom Guard. So you could consider taking Mortal Coil, Mortal Coiling one of your own minions. That's mm. not terrible. That's pa true. Power yeah. overwhelming. But then you throw it away. I mean, I can't see a situation here where he doesn't play Doomguard. Right. He so. actually yeah, has yeah, yeah, Soulfire, Finley, and a Murloc. Okay. So, so he went for Finley. Get some heals on the go. But he's going to throw it's it away. It's just going to get thrown right? right? away. I mean, the whole uh, discussion yeah. is fairly irrelevant. Because <laughs> yeah, he's most throw things it. that happened would get thrown away there. I think Power Overwhelming would have really been the one he was hunting for overall. I guess he was considering maybe he wants to change his hero power to heal himself, which has been pretty useful. Mm -hmm. But getting that Doom Guard right now is very useful as well. And Knife Juggler, nothing to juggle at all, unfortunately. And how much damage do we have here? Three, six, eight. Do you just go for up. it? Like, just go for the damage here to get the cycle on the quick shot to hopefully find Lethal next turn. I, you could. I mean, you could try to go for the damage right now. We don't have lethal on the side for on Oskaka's side, and he can't play abusive sergeant. We've actually seen three power overwhelming this game, and so he can't <laughs> use that to kill his opponent. So if Morgala just ignores his board and tries to get as much damage as possible, he might be able to race him. Yeah, I don't see any other line here apart from play your whole hand uh, at face <laughs> and cycle. just cross your fingers. Yeah, yeah. It, I think the the time is long since passed that you're going to win this on the board. Hunter's Mark on the Doom Guard makes sense, but I don't expect to see any of this damage going that way. Looks well. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Face. Interesting. Nice. All right, seven health Quickly. down to five after the heal oh! power, oh, and that's it. That's all oh! he needs. Right, so there needs to be lethal damage here from Olskaka or else he is out of the tournament. That's not it. Does he go for the tap? I mean, it's risky. So he's able to trade off 1-1s one here, and most cards that he would draw would add two damage. Um, so Direwolf Alpha, Abusive Sergeant. So he'd, he'd be forced to lose at least one damage by trading into the Knife Juggler to be able to play anything onto board. So honestly, what are his outs here for lethal if he taps? Doom Guard, that's it. Right. So he probably has a better chance of winning the game by not tapping, but it looks like he is going to go for the tap. That's Dark, Dark, Dark Iron Dwarf, excuse me. I think that's one off, if I'm not mistaken. Doesn't make any, because he, he has to trade two it's damage away anyway, account. so he No, just, he only has to trade one damage away. Right. He trades a 1-1 one, one off the board, and then he plays the Dark Ah, oh, then he plays the Dark Iron, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. But that is, I not believe, enough. 15 damage, as long yeah. as my basic math has not deserted me. 15 damage is not going to be enough here. It's probably going to be just trading off with this Knife Juggler and putting his opponent down to one. But then Morgulad is going to have enough damage to take out Oskaka here. And we're going to have another 
basically great player going down to lower bracket. <laughs> the world champion is falling down. Unbelievable stuff, yeah. Morgulard for him, this is just a huge feather in his cap. You see his expression there, like, how did I win this game? And just Kill Command Hero Power. May choose to do it with style with the Beast Synergy. Just get the nice clean uh, Kill Command. No, it's just going to Kill Command. Just don't three. misclick. That's, that's, all, that's yeah. all that's important. Here. Whatever you do, just don't misclick. Make sure you wrap all the way around the board <laughs> exactly. before you aim exactly. at that base. Yeah. What a tense game for these guys, especially Morgulad, someone who's not established in a scene, playing the world champion and then taking a win off him, sending him to lower bracket. That must be a boost of confidence. It has to be, yeah. I mean, in terms of scalps, the, the scalps don't come much bigger than the current world champion. And Oskaka is, is definitely regarded as a, as a fighting champion. He, he Everyone says he earns that. He was the best player at the time. So, you know, you are really sat there feeling like, you know, I've just, I've just beaten the best player in the world, the best of five Hearthstone, no big deal. And that has to put you in a really, really confident, comfortable position moving on through the bracket now. I think that was probably the best match of the day, honestly, because Oskaka, he played excellently, unfortunately fell down at the last moment, but from Ogilad, I mean, he had really solid lines of play at the entire time. Right. He had some games stolen from him by Oskaka because he just played great with yeah. those combo decks, but yeah. at the same time, his lineup, which is all over the place, but somehow it worked, that psychology major yeah. coming into <laughs> the play there, the PhD, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, just honestly, great play from both sides. Unfortunately, Oskaka falls down, but I was really happy to see that. Just great play from both sides and just see that match. It was a fantastic game. You know, we got to see back and forth. It was really tense at moments. It was just like, it, it could have went any way. And especially in that last game, you always want a tense final, like, game of the series because it just, oh, it was, it was fantastic. And I'm really happy for Morgallard. You know, he's uh, someone who's coming up. This is his big moment in the spotlight. I beat the world champion. I can message all my mates now and say, hey, look what I just did. Like, a big moment for him. So that was excellent. And it's one of the big things that the Hearthstone Championship Tour is about. It's about this kind of open, accessible thing where you don't have to be a big name player with a big organization and invites behind you to make this sort of splash on a big event like this. You can do it the hard way. You can grind your way up. You can earn the points and you can get your chance to be on a level playing field with Oskaka. And in this case, even just take that step above and defeat him. Yeah, exactly. And he is one match away from getting to that round of six and getting into the money. And obviously one match from there from getting into the round of eight. Hopefully for our sakes, because Oskok is such a great player, he's able to get out of the loser's bracket as well. All right, let's see what Froden has to say about this match and the player who just won. Well, I, I don't know what to say, guys. I think this is just upset city today here in the Europe preliminaries. Not only did the European champion and the runner-up, Nairi and Tice, get sent to lower bracket, so too has the world champion uh, from the European region. I also kind of want to update you guys on what's going on, too. Joining Oskaka, Tice, and Nairi in the loser's bracket, we have Sho from Team Liquid, a, a member of Savita's team there. Uh, Super JJ has also dropped, as well as European finalist Pavel. A couple other names that stick out, Powder, Vortex, they're also in the lower bracket, along with RDU, who lost to Mangolicious. However, uh, we also do have some cool news. Gara has continued to advance, defeating Azuka 3-1. And Jackie Chan, a player that people might know more for the actor's name than the actual person, uh, he's a person who revolutionized the Egg Druid on ladder that you might know. He defeated 6-0, 3-2, very closely in the winner's round three. So a lot of interesting stories shaping up. Uh, the last shout-out is some players who did get eliminated, unfortunately, very early on. On a green sheet from Team Dignitas, Hoy, uh, Oskaka, and Sixo's teammate got eliminated very early as well. And then you need the French player we mentioned, didn't end dropping. So some people are doing well, some people not doing so well. But what's interesting to see is the man of the moment. We have the winner of the previous series joined us on the line, who just defeated the world champion. Congratulations, Mork a lot. How are you feeling right now? Thank, thank, thank you, Frodon. I'm feeling great. I believe that. Us Uskaka is perhaps the best player in the world, and I'm really glad I managed to beat him. Oh, I bet, I bet. But you know what's really cool about not only the fact that you beat him, but you beat him with a very unique lineup. A lot of people aren't bringing Control Warrior or even Hunter class at all. Uh, what, what inspired you to take this type of lineup to a tournament where the stakes have never been higher for the European preliminaries? Uh, I've been really fond uh, of my Control Warrior. That's my favorite class. And last season, when P people said uh, Control Warrior was bad, that you shouldn't play Control Warrior on the ladder, I managed to finish uh, 19 le Legend on the European ladder, wow. playing mostly Control Warrior. And that brought me here. That's why I'm playing Control Warrior, because 
I think uh, psychologically, uh, you have to play decks you feel most comfortable with. Yeah, playing the best deck is the best decks is good, but we all have decks that we are be be better at, and decks that we are not so good at. I believe uh, Control Warrior gives me the best chance to win, and my win rate against Druid last season was 58 percent. And everybody says that's wow. one of the worst matchups for Control Warrior. That's extremely that's impressive. Yeah, everyone always talks about how Control Warrior struggles against Druid, but to have almost a 60% win rate is absurd. We have ourselves a, a Fibonacci from Europe here. It's, I mean, uh, or maybe you're willing to challenge that. Do you think you're the best Control Warrior player in Europe? Because there's a lot of really good players who specialize in that deck from that region. Uh, I can't say I'm the best Control Warrior player in Europe because I have... Uh, All right, well, that's completely fair then. A lot well, of things to learn more. I think the best control warrior player in Europe, the, for example, Shaw is a very good control warrior player. I've learned a lot from him. And yeah, I can't say I'm the best control warrior player in Europe, but perhaps I'm one of the guys that plays control warrior the most, even when everybody says you shouldn't play control warrior. Absolutely, and I think it's really great that you show respect for some of those players as well. I apologize for interrupting. You broke up there for a little bit. Uh, just to wrap this up, let's go ahead and give you an opportunity to take the platform. Is there anybody you'd like to thank, any practice partners, or anybody you'd like to shout out before you move on to your next match? Yeah, I'd like to, to thank uh, Walt Mongrel, my practice partner. He's a great card game player, and without his advices, without the training games with him, I wouldn't be here. And I'd like to thank uh, also Ellen Diriel, who always supported me and believed in me, even when I did not. Oh, wow, that's really sweet. Well, congratulations. You give him a reason to believe in you. And hopefully, we can continue to see more of you in the future. Thank you, Froden. I'll do my best. All right, so that was Morgulad, the winner of the previous series, taking out Oskaka. Now, don't worry, guys. I know a lot of people are watching the series and seeing some of their fan favorites fall down. But this is a double elimination bracket, and that's the reason why we give multiple chances for them to qualify for it. Ultimately, we're going to pick eight players to go to the Europe Championships next month for the BlizzCon qualifier. Who's going to be able to be the first person for this region? We'll find out more. We're going to have another match coming up. It's going to be really exciting. It's going to be Gara versus a player named Casper, which is pretty mysterious. Gar from Temple Storm, one of the players that always flies under the radar. Really excited to see how that's going to go down. Stay engaged in the conversation as well. Let us know what your thoughts on that series, whether both, uh, you know, in cheering for your favorite players who are in the bracket or posting some screenshots of just you playing along with us. Anything is fine. At Play Hearthstone on Twitter or Hearthstone on Facebook. In the meantime, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to have our fourth series of the day here in the Winter European Prelims. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. <laughs> 